Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Luncheon with the Experts, a carcinoid cancer foundation program brought to you by Ibsen Biopharmaceuticals. My name is Rain Bennett. I am your host this week and every week, and I'm a filmmaker and writer that's been working with CCF now for a decade, folks. Ten years that we've been working together, and in, in this field, we've seen a lot of developments in those ten years. I've learned a lot in those ten years, and and we create all kinds of video content. And if you look at our YouTube channel or if you just look at the videos tab here on the Facebook page where you are, Lots and lots of videos, hundreds of videos that we've created over those 10 years. Some of them are patient centric and they're documentary or story based. Uh, some of them are treatment based videos. And a lot of them in the past two years have been live video series like the one you're watching today, Luncheon with the Experts. But they all have the same mission in mind, and that is to educate people and raise awareness about this disease, about neuroendocrine tumors. That is what we are here to do. Uh, so if you are a regular to the show, you're probably already saying hello. And if you're new, I want to say welcome. We're here every week to help you. But another thing that will help you besides the, the information from, uh, from our guest presenters and besides just my charming self is the community itself. So tap in, say hello to everybody. They will embrace you. They will support you. They will help you along this journey. So I fully, fully, fully recommend you all getting to know the people within the community. It is stronger than, than one that I might have ever seen. I really, really appreciate that about the net community. And that's experts, that's patients, that's support group leaders, caregivers, everyone involved. And uh, I appreciate being a part of that. Before we start the show, we always want to thank our sponsor, Ipsen Biopharmaceuticals. Without their support, we wouldn't be able to do lunch with the experts. We always have this disclaimer from them, and that is that the opinions expressed by the guest presenters today, as well as the questions that you all, that the audience have asked, haven't been created or suggested by the sponsors of Luncheon with the Experts, and CCF doesn't endorse or promote any of the views, opinions, or information provided in the presentation. Audience members should not rely solely on the opinions or information expressed by the guests and should seek guidance and direction from their own medical advisors regarding any choices they make about their health or treatments. Okay, so that last line is really the takeaway there. We're going to give you some good advice, some good answers to your question. But by no means do we or our guests know your specific case. So take that advice, take those answers to your question back to your home team, which does, and make the best plan and path forward for you. Because if we have learned anything, if I've learned anything over the past 10 years working with CCF is that each case of this disease is effectively unique and therefore each plan and path forward is as well. Today, I'm very excited to welcome back to the show for maybe the third time, I don't know, one of our top <laughs> guests, Dr. Pamela Kuntz. How are you, Dr. Kuntz? I am great, Rain. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. It is sincerely always a pleasure to have you. And folks, if you uh, aren't familiar with Dr. Kuntz uh, and, and her, her knowledge and her experience uh, in, the, with this, in this field, with this disease, it is extensive. extensive. She's a great guest to have, very passionate about what she does, uh, which fortunately is not necessarily unique to, to her. I think a lot of the doctors and experts in this field are, are are really fighting for for the calls and and i appreciate that too but dr Kuntz, for those who aren't familiar with what you do or maybe your newish role a <laughs> year and a half tell us a little bit about uh yourself where you work what you do and, and the role that you feel that you fill in this neuroendocrine tumor community great yes ha happy to introduce myself so um, so I'm a GI medical net oncologist. Um, I will see nets outside of the GI tract. Patients sometimes ask me that. Okay. And um, I'm an associate professor of medicine at Yale Cancer Center in Connecticut. And I'm also the director of the Center for GI Cancers there. And I also serve as the vice chief of diversity, equity, and inclusion for medical oncology. And um, my research is primarily focused on clinical trials and translational research in neuroendocrine tumors. Awesome. Well, folks, um, go ahead and start sending in your questions. Uh, but uh, I talked a little bit with Dr. Coons before we started the show. She's got some exciting information about some of those clinical trials. And I know we talk about this every week. And so I know you'll have questions about, about this. So send in your questions about that. Send in your questions about anything pertaining to this. Uh, I think Dr. Kuntz is pretty comfortable fielding most of those. Um, so go ahead and start sending in your questions. And listen, we're going to try to get to them all. I promise you, uh, we won't get to them all because inevitably we have hundreds of them. It's really hard to do that, right? That's why we're here every week. So if we don't get to your question or if our answer, Dr. Kuntz's answer, uh, spawns a follow-up question and we don't have time to get to that, reach out to CCF. I promise you, this is literally their job and their mission is to help you. They will get you the information or get you the person's information uh, that will get you the answers to those questions. Okay. And we also have, as I've already alluded to a big video database with a lot of, I mean, almost all of these topics have been covered before. 
most likely multiple times. And so you can go through that database and try to find your answers too. So a couple of rules, uh, rules of the game before we get going. This helps me do my job more effectively, which is of course to serve you. Um, don't, don't make your answer, uh, your questions rather too case specific. Okay. Get, we get lost in the weeds, lost in the sauce. And Dr. Koontz doesn't know your specific case most likely. Okay. So keep it general so that we can give you good advice. If not, we'll still try to answer in a, a generic way so that, you know, you can think of all the things that you must consider, but that really helps us do our job. If I miss your question, don't be afraid to ask it again. I, the feed that I get isn't necessarily in real time. So I see questions from all over. So if you want to ask your question, you can ask it again. Don't bombard me too much with it. Uh, if we answer a question and you are responding or following up from a previous question, a little bit of clarification or a little bit of information in that follow-up, just to remind me what the question was about earlier, because there's lots of people tuning in. We've got almost 100 already, and we're only six minutes into the show. So that also helps. And the last thing I'll ask, I do it every week. You all do a great job of it. If you see a question in the sidebar that you also have, or you're also interested in the answer to, you can write under the comment, you can like it, love it. Any of the emojis, uh, Facebook or Meta uh, gives you the option to use. They all work effectively the same way for me. And that's to upvote it. That's I see there's a demand. If there's seven people that have the same question and we're getting hundreds of questions, I'm going to make sure that I get that one across. Makes sense? Great. Uh, let's see. We got people all over the states today. A lot of people on the West Coast. Um, good morning from Liberty Lake. Thanks, ECF. Dr. Koontz and Rain. Ursula back from South Africa. Hi from Elon as you're heading to Duke. Gene, you're very close to me. I'm real, real close to Duke. So let's go ahead and jump into what we were talking about, Dr. Kuntz. Um, we already mentioned clinical trials. I know you're going to get a lot of questions, so I don't want us to cover all the information right now, but let's just start with, with what's going on in your world in terms of clinical trials. What are you focused on and what are you working on currently? Well, Rain, top of my mind is the um, clinical trials that are coming out of the National Cancer Institute. Mm. And um, I think it's worth just talking about that as one of the mechanisms that we do um, through which we do clinical trials. Mm -hmm. And so the National Cancer Institute federally funded is one way we do some of these large multi-site clinical trials, especially perfect for rare diseases like neuroendocrine tumors, because we really need to partner with other institutions in order to get enough patients. So I've been lucky enough to serve as the chair of the National Cancer Institute Net Task Force. So this brings together um, investigators from multiple institutions who represent you know, different national clinical trial network groups. These bring together academic institutions to do clinical trials. And almost exactly a year ago, we had a clinical trial planning meeting to really set the next decade's worth of priorities for clinical trials in neuroendocrine tumors. Um, it's top on my mind because we're actually having a yearly update today. So after this, actually that's my next call. And um, I co-lead the task force with Dr. Simran Singh, who is in Canada. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm sure many of some of your other guests are, have, are also probably on this task force. One of our first clinical trials that is coming out of this um, clinical trial planning meeting effort is being co-led by Drs. Simran Singh and Dr. Aman Chauhan, who I think was actually a recent guest. Last that you guys week, yeah. Had. Yeah, yeah. And so he may have talked on this, but we are... Um, in development is a clinical trial that will be looking at PRRT retreatment. So that's exciting. Um, and then we actually have a number of working groups that are working on further developing clinical trial ideas and concepts. And so this is really team-based. I want everyone to know we actually do all work together and that community of physicians and clinical trial experts is actually very collaborative. And um, so we're working on thinking about, should we combine PRT with other medicines to make it more effective? Right. Should we be tailoring PRT doses? As patients know, it's a fixed dose right now. The starting regimen is really four doses at 200 millicuries. That's kind of the radiation dose. And there may be ways through the use of something called dosimetry to help us tailor that dose to specific patients based on kind of unique aspects of their body. So there, I think lots of really exciting ways that we're thinking about optimizing and making PRT safer. 
Got it. Uh, real quick, uh, am I correct in the four doses? Is that's just here in the states? Is that accurate? I mean, that that's a pretty. Um, I would say that's fairly standard in most places. Okay. That was so Netter one, which was mm -hmm. the clinical trial that led to approval, and that was an international clinical trial. That was four okay. doses. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so folks really, really quickly, before we move forward, this is for anybody, uh, most of the people here on the show and Dr. Koontz, you're aware of this are very well educated. They might've been dealing with the disease for a while. They're great at being their own best advocate, but there's a lot of people that show up to the show that are very, that are new. It might be their first time. Right. They might've gotten diagnosed last week. And so first of all, to those people, if you are one of those people listening, I want to let you know, cause sometimes it can be, it can be scary. It can be confusing. Listen, I learn a different term every week. Okay. I'm not a medical expert. Okay. Uh, so when we're dealing with jargon and acronyms, sometimes things can go move along very quickly. So I want you to know, like, don't feel that any question isn't valid. If you aren't sure what something is, ask it. That's legitimately why, why we are here. But I also try to do a good job myself of like laying down some foundation and some groundwork. I have a feeling we're going to talk a lot about PRT today. So Dr. Koontz, can we give a bit basic level, uh, understanding what that is? And I know, we, you know, that's, that's a big question, but just for someone who might be, like, what is that? We keep talking about that. And I want to make sure that they are, they're caught up to speed. Sure. Absolutely. So the acronym PRRT stands for peptide receptor radionuclide therapy. Um, think of it as a way to describe a class of treatments. It's like saying chemotherapy. Hmm. So PRRT describes a class of treatments. Right now we just have one in that class, but actually there's a number being developed. The peptide is a protein and the radionuclide is a radioisotope or a radioactive particle. And that peptide or protein in this case is something very similar to octreotide, which many of our audience is um, familiar with. It's a protein that attaches to a specialized receptor on the surface of neuroendocrine cancer cells called a somatostatin receptor. I like using the analogy of a lock and a key so imagine that, I, and I use my hands a lot, so the lock is <laughs> sitting on the surface of the cell, uh -huh. that protein or the key, the octreotide attaches to that lock. And in doing so, it triggers this cascade of, of events. And one of those things is slowing down cancer growth. So we know octreotide can do that. So then that same principle, the lock and key, if you attach a radioisotope or a dose of treatment radiation to that protein, it brings it directly to the cancer cell and that radiation helps serve as a treatment. Perfect. That I'll use my hands too. That was just the chef's kiss of an explanation. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much. Analogies and visual aids really help help people understand too, or at least for, for me, I think some people think that way. Okay. So folks, uh, I see questions coming in already, so let's not delay any, any further. Um, and I mentioned the part about the cycles because our friend Ursula from South Africa, uh, I'm familiar with her story. And she uh, said, I had five rounds. I'm not sure if it's different in, in, in SA. I had five rounds of PRRT. My medical aide is now requesting my gallium 68 PET scan. My last treatment was just uh, December 1st, 2021. And I'm worried that this is too soon. Uh, my first treatment was in February, 2021. And so they want to look at the results before approving my Sandostat. Any thoughts about that situation? So I may address that kind of generally, um, yes. which is around kind of what's the optimal imaging to use to monitor patients both during and after PRRT. Um, this is a little bit up for debate, but I will say that the primary imaging tool that we will use certainly to be eligible for PRRT you have to have a gallium 68 or a copper 64, one of these somatostatin receptor-based imaging tools. Um, and I may just briefly use that same lock and key analogy range to explain that. So that uses that same exact principle where on the surface of net cells is this lock. The gallium 68 uses that same principle where it takes a protein, but it has a much lower dose of radiation that serves as a light bulb. And so when it attaches to the lock and we take a picture, it lights up like a light bulb where the cancer cells are, but it also indicates to those of us who are treating patients that you have this receptor that can serve as a target for that treatment. And so gallium 68 or copper 64 scans are important to get prior to treatment 
But then in terms of monitoring patients on treatment, we usually recommend cross-sectional imaging. That would be either an MRI mm-hmm. or a CT scan. And that's because I, I like saying that the um, gallium 68 PETs show us the glow of the light bulb. So you see the glow, but you can't really see the size of the light bulb very well. So the CT and the MRIs do a much better job of showing us the size of the light bulb. And so we would typically get a CT or MRI every three-ish months or so um, during the course of a, you know, that's how I monitor my patients. And then the um, PET scan, the gallium 68 or copper 64 PETs are usually done um, at some point after getting PRT. And that that exact time point is a little debatable. I often wait. you know, many months afterwards. And then for patients who have metastatic disease, I usually get a PET scan every one to two years or to answer a specific question that may come up on a CT or MRI. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Our next question from Karen. Uh, Karen says, thanks for being here. What do you think about stopping or pausing shots if if there is no evidence of disease or if they're stable? So, um, so no evidence of disease and stable are slightly different things. But Understood. Can, yeah. There was a follow-up yeah. question that had stable. So let's take NED first. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I guess the, the question is, um, I, again, I don't know this patient's specific situation, but I generally would not have somebody on octreotide without evidence of disease. So okay. I think that it's generally indicated for patients with metastatic disease. It's often used in the first line setting for patients with low grade, grade one or two nets Mm -hmm. in an effort to try to help slow the growth of the cancer. And um, sometimes even for patients with newly diagnosed metastatic disease, if if um, if they are asymptomatic, don't have carcinoid syndrome or a functional neuroendocrine tumor that's secreting hormones, we might also consider observing the patient and getting regular scans prior to even starting octreotide or lanreotide. Um, Now, and then this question may have arisen if um, someone has had a surgery and is rendered free of radiographically free of disease. Um, In general, octreotide and lanreotide are not recommended as a post-operative treatment. Again, there are nuances to specific cases. And I think Wayne, you said it beautifully in the beginning, we really tailor decisions to individual patients. So it's hard for there to be a one size fits all answer. Sure, for sure. Yeah. Um, next question from Donna uh, about a different kind of shot. Uh, Dr. Kuntz, what are you what are you recommending to your patients for a four, potential fourth COVID vaccination? So Donna just completed uh, PRT standard for treatments a year ago, and she was told that she's not eligible for a fourth uh, shot or a second booster. Uh, she had her third six months ago. Any thoughts about that? I will claim not being an expert on this. So I don't want to misspeak and mislead our audience. I feel like this advice is changing very frequently. Um, so I am going to, um, decline to answer that. I just don't want to get it wrong. Yeah, no problem. And actually Donna, I see that one of this is one of the things I love about the show is the community chimes in as well. Tom yeah. says, uh, Donna, I just got my fourth. We are, we are eligible in his, in yeah. his situation. So yeah. and uh, that's ho- my general understanding, but yes, I, <laughs> so no, yeah, yeah. I understand. I mean, you're right. Things change all the time and they might even change place by place. I don't, I don't know, but thanks for chiming in there, Tom. That's helpful. Um, from Joe, Joe says any research being done on non-functional, no receptors, atypical lung nets with li- liver metastases. Um, great question. I might clarify just a couple things. So non-functional and not having receptors are, are different things. So non-functional means that, that hormones are not secreted. And that really, um, to the best of my knowledge, does not is not related to whether or not you have receptors. Okay. So, but um, presence or absence of receptors is an excellent question. Mm-hmm. And we think that about five to 10% of patients with neuroendocrine tumors do not have receptors. Um, I think that can be more common in lung neuroendocrine tumors. And um, excellent question, because I think it, you know, we then don't have the PRT available for those patients. And so there are, there is in fact research going on in that space. I think we definitely need more treatment options for those patients. So those will be not based on that lock and key principle of targeting the receptor 
it would be thinking about are there other systemic therapies, um, pills or IV treatments that can maybe work. And so there is work in that area also. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Folks, if you are just joining us or join us a little bit late, this is Lunch with the Experts at Carson and Cancer Foundation Program. We're here with Dr. Pam Kuntz. Uh, and listen, the numbers are looking great. We might, we might break a record today. Nice. Just, maybe, maybe. You always, <laughs> you always bring, bring, bring the, uh, the numbers, the high numbers, but we'll see. But folks, let's, let's help it out a little bit. If you know somebody that should be here or would benefit from this interactive session, you can tag them in the comments. You can share this video. You can tweet them, holler out the window, whatever you got to do. Let's get people here <laughs> in the room. You can always replay the video, but there's a lot more benefit, I think, from getting a question that you've been struggling with, getting it across to Dr. Coons today. Um, so from L. Ann, L. Ann says, I'm still suffering with chronic gas, bloating, and diarrhea. These are typical symptoms. I take lanreotide, lanreotide 60 milligrams each month, still have my gallbladder. I have a small bowel net with metastases to the liver, and I've tried everything over the counter. At this point, would Zermelo help or something else? So, um, so complicated question, and I will try to answer kind of more, more generally, yes. um, you know, the diarrhea gas bloating in patients with nets is a very common, um, symptom. And I think, um, I want to just say a few things about that. So Please. it's often multifactorial, meaning it's from multiple reasons. And I think when I try to teach other colleagues and doctors about these symptoms and nets, we can't always assume that it's carcinoid syndrome. So I think that's one really important thing. So carcinoid syndrome is defined as having measurable hormones in the urine or in the blood um, and symptoms from that hormone. So that's the most common definition. Um, Diarrhea, gas, and bloating can occur for many other reasons for patients with neuroendocrine tumors. So for example, octreotide and lanreotide can cause something called pancreatic exocrine insufficiency, which refers to a, an in, it basically blocks and lowers the pancreas's ability to secrete digestive enzymes. So in those cases, um, I'm sure many of our audience are on a medication called Creon or pancrease, which basically helps replace those pancreatic digestive enzymes. So that's one thing to try. Another, it, which was mentioned in this case, is many of our patients also have no gallbladder. And without a gallbladder, patients can have something called bile acid malabsorption, where the bile acid just kind of goes through their intestines and can lead to diarrhea. There's also a medication for that called um, cholesteramine that binds those bile acids. And then patients can have a whole host of other reasons for diarrhea, but I think that it's really important to have a stepwise approach to thinking about diarrhea um, and the gas and bloating symptoms. The question specifically was asking about Zermelo. Right. The indication for use of Zermelo is specifically for carcinoid syndrome diarrhea. So okay. if you don't have carcinoid syndrome diarrhea, it is not going to work for you. Got it. Thank you. Next question from Melinda. Do you, do you know any information about the connection between MEN4 and neuroendocrine tumors? Um, I am not super familiar about that. So I will, I will, I will pass on that question also. Gotcha. That's a, it's a newer um, kind of classification of MEN, and I am just not super familiar with that. To be honest, yeah, I, I hadn't uh, heard of that either. We talk a lot about MEN1 uh, on yeah. here. Um, um, if there's anything else, Melinda, please let us know. Stick around for the show. Uh, from Linda, my son had a 2.4 centimeter appendix net removed at uh, age 27, and a right hemocolectomy afterwards, two out of 23 lymph nodes uh, plus for the net. He is to be monitored for 20 years. So what would a reasonable monitoring schedule that would also, you know, what would be a reasonable monitoring schedule that would also reduce the risk of radiation exposure for such a long period of time? This is a concern that I hear often. Could a, could a net test be used to reduce some of the radiation monitoring? So a couple, couple mm -hmm. questions within that, within that question. What are your thoughts? Yeah, yeah. Um, so also just some general comments about that. So, um, a 20 year monitoring plan is long. I will say that per guidelines, um, a monitoring plan of seven to 10 years following a resection is the standard timeframe. So I guess that, that would be my first question is to go back and ask the doctor if, if there was a specific reason for the 20 year recommendation. Um, and yes, in terms of thinking about minimizing radiation. So 
The um, gold standard is still doing imaging. So, um, and I can, I'll get to the net test in a moment. So typically it's either with a CT scan or an MRI. For young patients, I actually very often will use an MRI for those monitoring scans because MRIs use magnets to help us take pictures and are no radiation. So that's often a very good thing for younger patients or for patients who have any concern about um, radiation exposure. And I think in terms of the net test and other um, prognostic and predictive biomarkers, um, they are all still in research and in development and not really used for um, routinely for that purpose. Okay, got it. Thanks for your question. Uh, back to some information on the trials. We have a lot of Canadians uh, that are here on the show. Um, and so Dorothy says, will Canadians be eligible for these trials that you mentioned, or are they just focused on the US? Yes, the Canadians are eligible for many of these trials. Maybe not all, but yes. Um, so my colleague Simran Singh is oh, at the right. University of Toronto. So Canada has its own national clinical trial network or NCTN group, it's called CCTG. It is included in the US um, kind of system for how we design, develop, and conduct these clinical trials. Um, so I will say there are some nuances, some clinical trials, if they are using standard of care drugs that are used through kind of your regular prescription benefits, there are sometimes some nuances in terms of what's reimbursed in Canada versus the US, but in general, we do include our Canadian colleagues and patients. Great, great news. Um, all right, so Skip uh, brings up a question that we've been talking about a lot here lately on the show. Um, are you as enthusiastic as others about alpha PRRT? And so even though this is a yes or no question, let's take a moment, let's explain <laughs> like what, you know, what, what alpha PRRT is and if you're excited or enthusiastic about it, why? Uh, and yeah, let's, let's talk about it. Yeah, I'll give it, I'll have a option C is cautiously <laughs> optimistic. <laughs> so, um, so I know I think it's exciting. The data we've seen are really, really small numbers. So Dr. Delpa Sand, who I think may have been a guest on this previously, mm -hmm. um, you know, just published some data on about 20 patients. So we are just at the beginning of this story. And um, I'm excited for a few reasons. So I think that, you know, the hope is, so this is an alpha emitter as opposed to lutetium dotatate, which is a beta emitter. And alpha emitters are hypothesized to be less toxic. So their path length, the kind of distance that that radioisotope travels is shorter. So it theoretically will have less toxicity to the normal surrounding tissues and may be able to be more focused in its delivery and therefore more effective. So it is hopeful. Um, and I'm excited to see some additional data and expanded clinical trials. Um, it's not available routinely, and it's not yet ready for prime time. Got it. Hey, thanks, Skip. Good to see your name, a little bit of your face in the avatar. Uh, Skip is a regular. Uh, Azad Great. says, uh, do net specialists get updated on progress in treatment, especially on diagnosis? Yes, absolutely. So I'll, I'm happy to share ways in which we disseminate information. Yeah, please. So there are um, a number of ways that we do this. So one, it would be the um, uh, National Clinical Trial or the National Comprehensive Cancer Network or NCCN guidelines. So these are guidelines for all cancer types. There are net specific guidelines. So there is a panel of physicians that reviews this multiple times per year. That is really the go-to for both academic and community physicians. And there is even actually a patient version of many of these guidelines. Um, uh, insurance agencies often refer to that also in terms of what they are willing to reimburse. So that's one. Um, another way is through professional society meetings. Um, so there is a neuroendocrine tumor professional society called NANETS, the North American Neuroendocrine Tumor Society, and I serve as an officer in that. Um, and that's a way we meet once a year. We also serve, have um, multiple events and activities throughout the year, and our primary goal is physician education. And so we have a number of webinars and other opportunities and, and guidelines, publications, et cetera. 
Another large professional society is the American Society of Clinical Oncology or ASCO. That is a 40,000 member international society of oncologists. And we also present um, data and clinical trials research, et cetera, at those meetings. And then those updates often make their way into journals and get published. And so there are lots of ways that, that we do that. And just, I will say next week um, I'm giving, so kind of like this and for mm -hmm. patients, we also have webinars for physicians. And so I'm doing yeah. that through Yale. Um, we actually have a continuing medical education event for physicians next week. Got it. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you for sharing that. Um, folks, we are about halfway through today. A lot of great questions coming in and many more lined up in queue. So we're going to keep moving forward. Um, Dana says, hello. Thanks again for these talks. We appreciate you guys. We appreciate you too, Dana. Question, are necrotic liver nets something to be concerned with, or is that an indication that the land reotide treatment is actually working and shrinking them? So let's, we can talk about one of these jargon words, necrosis, and what mm. that means. So necrosis can actually mean a few different things. So sometimes larger tumors can outgrow their blood supply, and the middle can be necrotic. Necrotic means cell death. Yeah. And so um, in that case, it's because of the size of the tumor that we see some necrosis. But we can also see necrosis in response to treatment. Mm -hmm. So it's really variable. And again, without knowing the specifics of the case, it's hard for me to know. But I will say that with lanreotide and octreotide specifically, we don't generally see tumor shrinkage. We usually see stability. So it would be a little bit unusual to see necrosis as a direct result of the octreotide or lanreotide. So most likely that would be the first size of the tumor, likely, but again, hard, hard to know course. without the yeah. details. Yeah, of course. Uh, and if that is the case, uh, approach concerns. I mean, it's sort of, um, it, again, it really is case specific. It depends on the size of the tumor. Necrosis in and of itself is not dangerous to a patient, but I think mm -hmm. that if we were to be seeing growth of those individual liver lesions, um, that often is an indication that we need to change treatments. Yeah, got it. Thank you for that. And thanks for your question. Uh, next question comes from Tom, who's already chimed in once to help out another, another attendee. Uh, Dr. Kuntz, for those of us with SB, small bowel nets, multiple resections and metastasis to regional lymph nodes, can we avoid sandostatin injections if our tumors are well differentiated and relatively low grade? Um, Rain, I don't know. It, it sounds like this is a, not a metastatic or it, it or is metastatic. I can't said multiple resections metastasis. and metastasis to regional regional. Okay. So, I mean, maybe I'll, I'll answer that in a few different ways. So there is, um, no clear indication for octreotide and lanreotide in patients who've had their disease completely resected. So regional lymph nodes are often those that are removed at the time of surgery. And so at present, um, there is no known role for adjuvant, that's the doctor word, or post-operative treatment for patients who have a curative intent surgery, meaning the goal is to take out all the cancer in a localized kind of regional way. There's no role for any post-operative treatment, plan reotide or other. Um, for the, the indication for octreotide and land reotide is really for patients with either carcinoid syndrome or functional neuroendocrine tumors and those and or patients with metastatic disease. So, um, so I think if this patient has, has had a surgery with all visible tumor removed, there's no clear indication for octreotide and land reotide. So we might be able to spare, spare using it. Got it. Hey, thanks, Tom. Uh, from Brian, uh, should PRRT be considered as a first treatment before octreotide or lanreotide? Common question, common thought. Yeah, really good question. And guess what? We have a clinical trial for that now. <laughs> so, um, so there is a clinical trial called NETTER2. So um, some of you on the call may remember that NETTER1 was the name or acronym of the clinical trial that led to the approval of, of PRT or ludotate in the second line setting, meaning after progression on octreotide or lanreotide. We are now studying this in the first line setting, meaning the first treatment for patients with GI and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. 
Um, this is another large international study. It is basically taking patients and they are randomized to either receive four doses of Lutifera mm -hmm. or um, high dose octreotide in the first line setting. And it's for patients with a KI67 of 10 to 55%. So it's a slightly grade two and some of the well differentiated grade three neuroendocrine tumors. And I'll remind people randomization means I don't get to pick and you don't get to pick which treatment arm you're on. The computer generates that. And in this case, patients have a two out of three chance to go on the Lutifera and a one out of three chance to go on the high dose octreotide. So that's net or two. Got it. Um, yeah, that's exciting. I know a lot of people are, are interested in that. From Patty, if the tumor burden is too extensive in the liver, is a liver transplant ever considered? Primary is a PNET, which has remained fairly stable in size since prognosis grade two. So um, I will say that a, a liver transplant is, is rarely considered, um, and it's really only considered for patients who have liver-only disease. So if this particular patient still has their pancreatic primary in place, they would not be eligible for a liver transplant. And it's in general for, um, I've seen it used less than a handful of times. And I think part of the reason is over the last decade, we've really had um, some success in development of many other effective systemic treatments like PRT and others. And a, a liver transplant is, a, is high risk and has a number, of, um, a number of side effects that are associated with it. So it's really balancing risks and benefits. Got it. Um, from Merlin, Marilyn, uh, let me know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. How long after receiving a liver bland embolization should a patient receive uh, an, an MRI to evaluate the outcome of the embolization? So um, great question. Maybe a good chance to define what some of these liver directed treatments sure. are. So there are a number of them. A bland embolization is one of them. Bland just means an embolization is blocking blood vessels. So mm -hmm. the liver is a unique organ in that it has two sources of blood that go to it, one from the hepatic artery and one from the portal vein. And the hepatic artery preferentially feeds tumors. And so what our interventional radiology colleagues can do is they insert a catheter into your groin and they feed it up next to the liver and they can selectively um, block blood vessels to select tumors. And they use imaging to help guide them. So bland embolization, they use a gel foam to block a blood vessel. Chemoembolization means they use insert some chemotherapy and block the blood vessel. Radioembolization are small little plastic resin beads that are coated with a dose of radiation. So the beads themselves block the blood vessels and they deliver radiation. So those are the three main forms of embolization. And the monitoring plan is very similar to what I mentioned before. So typically staying on, a, on an interval of getting scans, an MRI or a CT about every three months. And usually the first scan after embolization is about a month or so after. Got it. Awesome. Thank you uh, for your question. Next question from Katie. Can you explain why a non-functional PNET might go from needing mealtime insulin prior to PRRT to not needing it for a couple of weeks following PRRT? What, what's the question again, Reem? Can you, can you explain why a non-functional... Why, why it might happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, so the somatostatin receptor um, and kind of basically targeting it with either octreotide or with PRT, as I'd mentioned before, that lock and key attachment triggers a cascade of events. This interaction is inhibitory. So it kind of blocks things. So it slows tumor growth. It decreases the secretion of the pancreatic digestive enzymes, and it also can affect insulin metabolism. So we can sometimes see changes in blood sugar following octreotide or lanreotide, and even with PRRT. Got it. Uh, next question. How frequently do you see diabetes occur after a patient has taken sandostatin, LAR, or lanreotide for many years? 
So it's a related question. So it's, you know, all related to blood sugar metabolism. And, um, you know, and I think what, um, what I don't know about this case, certainly in patients with resected pancreatic nets are also especially at high risk for developing diabetes because they don't have as much of their pancreas around to secrete insulin. But octreotide and lanreotide can also affect um, insulin production in the pancreas and can, can lead to some elevated blood sugars and in some cases, diabetes. Got it. Uh, from Allison, a couple of medication uh, questions. We already talked about Zermelo. Are there, any, are, are there many side effects with Zermelo? So Zermelo is a, um, is a pill. It's given three times a day. So I think there is um, you know, it's a, it's a balancing act. When I talk with my patients about considering starting it, some patients love pills and don't mind taking a three mm -hmm. times a day pill and others would rather, you know, do a self-injection of octreotide. So it just depends on if you like needles or pills better. And, um, and then Zermelo in terms of the side effects, very well tolerated, um, can in fact lead to some constipation. So it's, I think it just depends on the level of bowel movements for patients, but it, it, it's intent is to slow down bowel movements. So as a kind of the flip side of that is sometimes patient that we can swing a little too far and patients can get constipated. Got it. Uh, another question from, from uh, Allison. If Creon doesn't help with diarrhea, is there another medication for pancreatic enzyme inf insufficiency that you would recommend? So there are different formulations of pancreatic enzymes. And um, what I usually recommend is working with either a dietitian or a gastroenterologist, but there are multiple different brands and formulations and different doses. So sometimes it is a little bit of trial and error figuring out which might be the best fit for you. Got it, got it. Uh, question from Brian. This is a big picture question, uh, but it's interesting. When we think of this as, a, as chronic disease management, which often we do, right? When we're talking about that. Yes. Why should we even have a year slash time limit put on treatment and testing? Um, I guess I don't understand. I think this isn't, go ahead. No, go ahead. I think this is relating to a previous answer that we had. I think maybe when we were talking about follow follow-ups, uh, that's my guess. And Brian, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, because we talked about generally it's seven to 10 years. I think that's, oh, what, I, see. I think that's what, what this is relating to. Um, so because if this is a chronic disease management that we're going to manage uh, ostensibly for, you know, the rest of our lives, potentially, why would there be like a, a limit on? Yeah. That? Yeah. So actually I'll, I'll clarify my, my response to that. So okay. for patients who have a curative intent surgery, so they have a localized pancreatic net, for example, and we do a surgery that removes all visible disease, their monitoring plan is for seven to 10 years. Okay. So for patients who have metastatic disease, um, absolutely right. This is chronic disease management for patients okay, with the low grade, grade one or two neuroendocrine tumors. They will get a life lifetime of scans, and um, and so I, you know, I think that's a really important factor in thinking about survivorship issues for patients with a chronic cancer like NETS, where we think about the chronicity of scans and side effects and the toll it can take on mental health. And um, that's time for like another whole hour of conversation. But <laughs> I think that the um, really the, the chronicity of what patients with metastatic low grade neuroendocrine tumors have to go through is a lot. And I think that there are some programs that are starting to deal with that um, really to help think about patients holistically. Got it. Hey, Brian, if uh, I don't want to misrepresent your question or your words, so if that wasn't accurate, let me know uh, and clarify in, a, in another comment, uh, but hopefully that helped. Uh, next question from Igide. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Let me know if not, if that's important to me. Uh, I am part of a PRRT trial while staying on Sandostatin. So my question is, why is, it, is Sandostatin still necessary during the PRRT treatment? So that is an excellent question and one that is up for debate right now in the medical community. So the NETR1 clinical trial had patients stay on octreotide while on the study. Um, it was given every eight weeks. Um, the FDA approval also officially has octreotide paired with, and you give it 
immediately after, and I'll explain that in just a moment, after the PRT within as early as four hours, but up to 24 hours after receiving the PRT. Um, in practice, many of us, including myself, for someone who has a non-functional neuroendocrine tumor, so they don't need octreotide for controlling hormones, mm -hmm. um, if they've had progression on octreotide and I'm switching to PRRT, I do not continue the octreotide. Um, there is a scientific hypothesis that octreotide may help by maintaining the octreotide, it may theoretically help kind of focus the PRT into where the tumor cells are. We have somatostatin receptors throughout our body and some other places. So the theory is that maybe it does a better job of kind of helping focus the radiation dose where the tumor is. Um, that's not been proven. I think it's still debatable. But the clinical trials are generally being designed in this in the same way, where they use octreotide as being given immediately following the Lutathera treatment. Got it. Uh, thank you so much, Igide. And let me know again if I'm pronounced that correctly. And also, I think it's the first time I've seen your name. So if you're new to the show, welcome, welcome. Appreciate you being here. Uh, I've seen this question a couple of times. I think today does, let me try to pull that up. Does um, Lanreotide cause jaundice is the question. I'm trying to find where that was, but I've seen that a couple of times. Is that in your um, experience? Not, not to my knowledge. Um, octreotide and Lanreotide that, and I should mention, these are very similar medications made sure. by different companies. They have the same mechanism of action. They're both injections. Octreotide is intramuscular and landreotide is deep sub -Q. So no, that's not a common side effect. I will say that patients with metastatic nets, particularly to the liver, are at risk for getting jaundice if they have a blockage of any of their bile ducts. So maybe unrelated to the landreotide or octreotide. Okay. Got it. And that question was from Mary. Thanks, Mary. Question from Tom. This is back to Zermelo, which we've talked about a few times today. Um, do you, well, what is your experience with Zermelo? Do you think it could be effective with carcinoid heart disease to control the amount of circulating serotonin that enters the tricuspid valve? Um, also a really great question. And just for our audience, I'll explain that the, the theory is that for patients with carcinoid syndrome, serotonin directly causes this scarring or fibrosis on heart valves, particularly the valves that are on the right side of the heart. So that's the um, tricuspid and the pulmonary valves. And um, it's an excellent question. And in fact, there's a clinical trial for that too. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it's being studied in this, it, at MD Anderson. Um, they have a small clinical trial there. Um, great hypothesis. Um, so we don't know the answer to that yet. Um, I'll add another question because I get asked this sometimes too. Does Zermelo have an anti-tumor effect? Like, would it slow down the growth of the cancers? And that's also being studied in a clinical trial. Lots, lots being studied right now. It seems this is yeah. this is a this is a period. Uh, you know, we often talk about. You know, I've been working at CCF for ten years, as I said at the beginning of the program, and so much I don't need to tell you has happened in terms of the, the, our ability to diagnose and treat this disease in this past ten years. So much, right? Yeah. Right. Leaps and bounds a lot of the times. And I feel like we're, we're at the, it seems to me just from kind of being somewhat on the outside or at least tangential. Oh, you're an insider rain. <laughs> all right. All right. Stop. Uh, but it seems like there's so much activity going on right now. It seems like we're at the, the birth or the beginning of another one of those cycles or periods or eras. I, I think, I mean, there's just so much activity going on right now. So much is being studied. Um, and I think a lot of it did come from, you know, PRT in, in 2018. So we have a lot more information, right. In the past four years, but it's, it's exciting. Uh, you know, are, 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 do you feel that from your side of things is an exciting uh, time for you being a, an expert? I, especially? I do. Yeah, no, I share that enthusiasm and that hope. And that's often how I end many of my patient interactions, particularly mm -hmm. with new patients is to say that, like, I have a lot of hope for the future and it's, um, you know, I got into the field of neuroendocrine tumors as a oncology fellow. So that was like in 2005 or something. And at that time, if people remember the timeline of drug development, we had none of these drugs. We had octreotide and streptozocin in 2005. And um, so it's been a really exciting time to be a, a net physician and researcher, um, and really rewarding to be able to share that with patients. So I, I share that hope for sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. There's definitely a lot of activity, a lot of, a lot of the right questions, I think being asked and, and not just asked, but actually like debated and discussed and now, you know, put into trials. So hopefully in the next few years, we'll see a lot of uh, new developments uh, from right. Zoe. Zoe says, uh, thank you, Dr. Kuntz. Is there an average time, typical lung nets to remain unchanged before a change is noted? So good question. And unfortunately, no, there is no set time frame, And I, um, it, that's, that's hard, I think, from a patient's perspective. And the way I talk and describe this um, is, is to say that, you know, once someone is newly diagnosed, it's really that first year or so that teaches a lot, that tincture of time teaches us about the biology of that patient's individual cancer. Now we can look at the pathology and get some hints about um, kind of pace of growth based on grade or KI-67 and some other features. But I think that it's very individual and it's really by mon getting these monitoring scans that help teach us about the biology of that disease. Got it. Thanks for your question. Next question from Stacy. What does it mean when results say median PFS not reached? Oh, good question. So um, we're get, getting in the weeds a little bit on the clinical trial jargon, um, but median PFS or progression-free survival is one of our primary endpoints for clinical trials in neuroendocrine tumors. So when, when a clinical trial is designed, we have to pick, well, what's the, what's the goal of the, of the trial? Like wh what are we basing our statistics around? Um, for many, cancers outside of the world of neuroendocrine tumors, it's overall survival, like how long does someone live? For neuroendocrine tumors, we pick time that it takes for patients to progress mm -hmm. because grade one and two neuroendocrine tumor patients tend to live longer and then go on to get multiple other therapies after a trial. So that overall survival endpoint becomes a impractical endpoint because it's longer than some of our other solid tumors. So median progression free survival. So that essentially means it, the time that it takes half of patients on that trial to progress. And, um, and then we also look at other endpoints like overall survival and response rate and safety. And those are usually considered secondary endpoints. Um, next question from Kathy, folks, we got a few minutes left, so we're going to keep plugging along. What drug would you recommend for heavy burden uh, or heavy burden liver with PNET and but not a candidate for PRRT? That's that's a great question, and we haven't really touched on this yet. So patients with pancreatic nets um, have a few more treatment options in the toolkit than than some of our other primary sites, and one of which is chemotherapy. Um, Chemotherapy, just saying the word, engenders a lot of anxiety, I think, right. for lots of patients. And um, I recognize that. Um, one trial that I had the opportunity to lead a couple of years ago was one that examined CAPTEM, which many, and I'll describe what that is. So capecitabine and temozolamide are oral chemotherapies. Um, and I would say that we often, as a community, will use those for patients with bulky pancreatic nets that are metastatic, ones that are maybe causing symptoms like pain from the size, or especially if they are secreting a hormone and we really need tumor shrinkage. So CAPTEM has our best shrinkage rates um, for out of really all of the available therapies for pancreatic nets. Um, we don't have as strong a data for using that in other net primary sites. I will occasionally use that in lung nets. Um, it tends to not work as well in small bowel nets. Got it. Got it. Um, can a slow growing net tumor become high growing uh, with time? So we can see change over time. Um, I think that there was a, um, a beautiful study done by friends and colleagues, doctors Diane Reedy Lagunas and Nietzsche Raj out of Memorial Stone Kettering that looked at patients who'd had multiple biopsies over time. Um, these were just net patients with nets. And um, we do see something called grade migration. So grade can change as um, these neuroendocrine tumor cells acquire mutations. We can see some change of the grade. 
the way I typically use that information and think about it is if I am taking care of a patient in whom I see a real sudden change of growth on a scan that really feels out of proportion to what I know about their grade based on if, if it's a grade one and the low KI-67, I may consider a rebiopsy. And that may in fact inform and help me tailor the treatment a little bit better. Got it, got it. Uh, folks, we got about five minutes left and we have a couple questions come in. Before we move forward, I wanna correct the pronunciation that I asked about earlier, it is Ajid. Uh, and I hope I'm saying it correctly now, but again, I still think uh, you might be a first timer uh, or new. So welcome. Uh, we've had a couple of questions here at the end, Dr. Kuntz, about mental health. Um, somebody said it's so nice to hear a physician um, basically talk about, you know, understanding what it's like to to have this and be dealing with scans and follow ups for, for 20 years. And then we had, yeah, it's so nice to hear physicians say we understand the mental health part of ongoing, uh, you know, lifelong treatment, essentially. And then uh, Reese says, you've mentioned mental health a couple times a day. And my question is that I sometimes find myself concerned about having cancer. Maybe I'm getting in my head a little bit. I'm very positive, you know, glasses half full type. Um, but is this a, a considered a normal reaction about being, That's, you know, go ahead. Yeah, no, such, such a great question. And I um, appreciate that that sort of comment resonates with the audience. Mm -hmm. It's, um, you know, I encourage you to make that part of what you talk about with your treating team. And I think that um, it's easy to get caught up in the kind of focusing on the chemo and the scans, et cetera. But I think that, you know, we want to be sure that your mental health is being addressed also. And there are many institutions and teams that have support teams that can also help with that. So I rely, and to answer that patient's question directly, yes, it's very normal to think that any new symptom you may have could be related to the cancer. And I think mm -hmm. use your oncology team to help you triage those questions because mm -hmm. you're allowed to get normal things too. And so it may be that we say, go talk to your other doctor or your primary care physician. But I know that my team and I often will serve it that in that triage role to help think about, you know, is this new symptom from your cancer? And we recognize that scans generate a lot of anxiety. And if, if that some, is something that's hard for you, talk about that with your treating team. And so it's, there are social workers, there are um, psychologists and psychiatrists who partner with oncology teams at many institutions. So there are lots of resources for this. Yeah, I appreciate you mentioning that. And I, and I love that that's one of one of your values. And it's very clear, you know, when when, when talking to you uh, and listening to you. And uh, I mean, I think the personal journey is so important uh, in any disease, but specifically in this one, because it is so unique in case by case. Um, and when we talked before we started recording or started the show today, you know, and you told us at the top of the program that you're on the board of diversity and equ equity and inclusion, um, in medicine and oncology, but specifically, we talked about this in terms of looking at how we design trials. And can we, can we take a few minutes? We still do have a couple of left and talk about that because that was really interesting to me uh, about really implementing that in terms of the designing of trials. What what is your goal here, and why is it important to to come at it from from a diversity of thought uh, angle perspective? Yeah, thanks, Rain, for letting me talk about this briefly. So just for the audience, I think another hat that I wear and for people who follow me on Twitter know that I advocate for diversity, equity, and inclusion in the oncology and medical workforce. And I'm a big believer that diversity, equity, and inclusion in the medical workforce really can translate into patient health equity. And, and Rain and I were specifically talking about that. Well, how can it, how can diversity of thought help us come up with more innovative science. And I think that by having different ideas and minds at the table and differences of opinion, we can be more creative and innovative as we think about novel clinical trial designs, novel eligibility criteria, more inclusive eligibility criteria, and also being more inclusive of our patient community and ensuring that underrepresented minorities and other marginalized groups can be included. So I just, I think that there, it's really two sides of the same coin where workforce diversity, and I think as patients, we know that diverse physicians can generally, can often provide great care. And I think that we all need to embrace diversity because it makes us all better. 
Absolutely. And, and listen, folks, I, you, you all know that I'm not a medical expert, but I am a communication expert and I study, uh, pe- you know, people a lot and empathy. And listen, it's, it's, it's very, very clear that people, it's extremely important for people to feel seen and heard and understood when they're talking about the personal journey, especially one that is as, as significant and tough to navigate as this. And so I think this is directly tied to the mental health conversation as well. Because if you don't feel like that, that, that uh, your path forward, specifically for someone like you in your situation, is available, it's pretty hard to feel like you have a, a real fighting chance, right? Like that, that's the angle that I come from. And so whenever we get talking about this sort of stuff, I get animated and I get passionate because this is where this is my world, right? And so I love, uh, I love when I see it, um, uh, you know, overlapping with the medical community because historically, right, we kind of, kept them compartmentalized and it's not it's not it all intersects and so i appreciate the work that you do and i'm excited because it's not i mean you are unique you are awesome but fortunately (laughs) this approach isn't isn't unique to just you and that makes me really hopeful and really happy to see that other uh, doctors in this community share those values it's really important you know yes yeah, absolutely. Um, well, everybody had a great time today. I'm seeing all the comments and we'll send you some of those. Uh, Patricia or Pat Murphy, our friend of the foundation says, thank you, CCF, Ibsen, Rain, and Dr. Coons for an excellent informative program today. Uh, thank you for all the great information. Fernando says, love this. Thank you, Dr. Coons. I appreciate you being here. I know that we could probably talk for hours. Uh, your passion shines through every time. Thank you for spending some time with us today. Thank you, Rain. And thanks to everyone for joining. Absolutely. And folks, thank you as well. And we hope, uh, as always, this program helped answer some of your questions. I'll reiterate one more time, follow up CCF. If you have other questions, you can reach them here. You can direct message them on Facebook, or you can reach them at their website, carcinoid.org. And we always like to thank again, our presenting sponsor, Ipsum Biopharmaceuticals. Without them, we couldn't do the show. And finally, my name is Rain Bennett. I have been your host. Thank you for watching and please join us next time on Lunch with the Experts. Stay healthy, stay safe, everybody. Bye-bye.